heard that uh, you have chosen to, to come to Southside and worship with us this morning, the last Sunday of the year. And so uh, what a great place to be in the Lord's house. Just want to remind you of a couple of things. I just want to tell you, I'm not sure exactly what the amount is for Lottie Moon. The only thing I can tell you is we had a $5,000 go, and we surpassed that. So I, I don't know what the final number is, but we have gone past that. And we still have today and tonight to, if you haven't given anything for the uh, mission offering, my, actually the sermon I'm going to preach today, which is a, a kind of like an automatic thing. I didn't know that it would uh, line up so much. Uh, with Lottie Moon, but it is the last uh, sermon on a Sunday morning. Now tonight, we will be back in church. Y'all y'all know me long enough. No, I don't cancel church for nothing. I can tell you that now. So I don't know of a better way to start New Year's off than in the house of the Lord. Back in my younger years, I used to do midnight services everywhere, and we'd welcome in the Lord. You probably sung it plenty of them too, had you? But I ain't going to keep you up that late tonight. Um, but I am going to move back into, I started, preached two sermons in November on the perfect ending, which is an outline of the end of time, signs of the end. I talked to you, I went through where we are today. I talked to you about what's next was the rapture of the church. Tonight I am going to talk to you to tell you and show you about four horsemen in the book of Revelation that describe what the last seven years of earth as you and I know it will be like. God is very distinct about that. And we'll be teaching about the four horsemen of the apocalypse tonight. Uh, that'll begin and then on Sunday nights we'll be into the perfect ending for some time now. So, because I believe we are coming close to the end. Also, I um, want to remind you, if you haven't got your tithing envelopes, they're, they're here on the uh, front row. Just come by and get your box and, and take them home with you. And whatever you gave this year, just double it up next year, and we'll be just fine uh, if you do that. Okay? All right. Um, think that's any other announcements that we need to make anybody all right if not let's pray our heavenly father thank you god that god on the last lord's day of this year god uh, the folks that are in worship god i know that for most of the people in the world uh, uh, new year's eve is a, a party day uh, a good time day god but it's the Lord's day. No matter where it falls on man's calendar, it's the Lord's day. And so, God, I thank you for just the privilege of being here and being able to come into this house and share your word, God, with these folks for a little while this morning and tonight. God, we thank you as we close this year, as we look at our church. God, what blessings you have given us. God, all the things that you have done for us. And God, I pray now as we go in after today and we start a new year after tonight, that God will continue to honor you and serve you and that God, that you would continue to bless. I thank you, God, that we have reached our mission offering uh, even before we get to days. And Lord, uh, I just want to say that you've been mighty good to us, better than we deserve. But God, I thank you for loving us like you do. I thank you for loving us most of all by sending your son Jesus to die on that cross. That God, we would have the opportunity one day of leaving this old dark world and going to a place called heaven. Thank you for that love where God so loved the world. Lord, we love you. Lord, I pray that next year will be a great year for us. And that we'll honor you and give you glory for it. For it's in Christ's name that we do humbly pray. Amen. Let's stand together as Mimi comes and lead us. And let's sing majesty. Worship his majesty.
Thank you, Mimi. Thank you, church. All right, children, y'all come on down now. I have a, a tough little story to tell you this morning, but I believe y'all can handle it today. I would just come on down. There you go. There you go. How y'all doing? Last day of the year, right? Mars, brand new day, new year. I want to tell you just a little story this morning, and I have to be very careful with this because of your age. There was a king, and, and we've talked about him a lot, whose name was King David. Well, as King David got older, of course, like most folks, death was something he's having to face. Well, before he got ready to die, he called in one of his sons, whose name was Solomon, and he told him, you go be the new king when I'm gone. Well, Solomon didn't feel like he was ready for it. So he did what we should do. And if we, I could tell you or the folks here, this year, read your Bible and pray more. It'll be a better year, hopefully, for you. So he prayed. And this is what he said. Lord, I... This is Solomon, and my thing is, I'm going to be the new king, and I'm going to have to make a lot of decisions. Some of them will be good ones, some will be bad. And, and, and God looks at Solomon, as I said, he says, well, Solomon, what do you want me to do for you that can help you? What do you want? I'll give you anything you want. And Solomon said, the thing I'm going to need the most is wisdom. Because I'm going to be making decisions that I've never had to make for. A king has to have a whole nation of people he's got to look out for. So how do we know that Solomon got that wisdom? Well, in the very next chapter, I believe it is in the Bible. Go ahead, bud. He gave him everything because he asked for wisdom. That's exactly right. He gave him everything he needed, exactly, because of wisdom. But one day, there was a woman that came to Solomon. And she was crying. And this is what she said. I have a lady that stays with me in my house. She and I, now think about this, had little baby boys. We had them the same day. So they were about the same age. They were the same age. They, they were like, and we went to bed one night. The lady that had the other little baby laid on it, and it did not wake. So the lady that was in the other room that had the baby, she goes in her room, and you know what she does? takes her baby and claims it as her own. Well, when this mother wakes up and she sees what has happened and she looks and she says, well, that's not mine, she's taking mine. So they go to the king because the king has to make decisions about these things. So what do you think Solomon was going to say? Is it hers? Is it hers? Is it hers? Is it hers? You think he's going to say, I don't know who that baby belongs to? No. Remember what God gave him? Wisdom. So, Solomon says, this is what, now this is a little crude, but this is truth in this. He said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll lay that little baby down here, and I'll go get one of my swords. We're going to take that sword. What? You can take half? You can take half. That sounds cruel and bad, don't it? But there was one lady that said, No, do not do that. You let her have him. 
And Solomon said, you are the mother of that baby. You are the mother of that baby because you was not willing to let anything happen to him. And so he takes that baby and he gives that baby back to his rightful mother. Now, one thing, we talked about Solomon having wisdom, right? Now, how many of you, including myself, would have thought about making a decision like that? Not me. Not most anybody else would be. But he listened to God. And all through most of his time living on this earth, God blessed him because he listened to what God said. He made great decisions, not all of his life, but the biggest part of his life. So when we listen to God, one thing we know about God is what? He will not tell us anything that will hurt us with him. He wants us, he loves us, and he cares about us. And when we go to bed at night and we say our prayers or, or whatever we do, we know that there's a God up in heaven that listens to us. So, let's just thank God when we pray for every day. And I pray in this year that you come into. I've watched many of you grow and grow. And I'm amazed at what God may have in store for you one day. Just listen to Him and pray. Get Mom and Daddy to pray with you. Do that, okay? Father, I thank you. For these children, Lord, that come, Lord, who knows? There might be a Solomon in here, wise beyond his age, that trust you as he or she get older here, that God, they'll learn to lean on you. God, uh, I pray that next year, not just for these, but for all of our families, that God, if we've been going through a valley sometime this year, God, you're going to open that and pour that light down on us. That God, we're, where we may end up this year as a people that God may not see a lot of hope. Joy comes in the morning. In the morning will be another year. So God, I pray that you put joy in people's lives. In these kids' lives this year, give them joy. Bless them. Bless their parents, their grandparents. Bless them all. For it's in Christ's name that we do only pray. Amen. Amen. Okie dokie. Oh, my goodness. Got so much stuff in here, I can't hardly pick this thing up. Woo! I'm telling you. Man. It's overflowing. <laughs> so, all right, here we go. Go with these two young ladies here, and they'll help you out while I try to help these folks out. This time we're going to have our offertory prayer, and, and uh, we'll ask our ushers to come forward. I, I picked this song out particularly because in a church, this is what I want in the church and what God wants, that sweet, sweet spirit where we love each other and care about each other. And for it to be said in any church that there's a sweet, sweet spirit here is one of the greatest things to be said. And Mimi will come and lead us in that. And our ushers will take up the offering. Father, God, as we take up the offering today, Lord, I pray that you'll take this as we do on our Wednesday night dollar that we give, Sunday night a dollar, that God, you'll take this and multiply it. 
God, I thank you for the uh, Lottie Moon offering that's been given. And God, uh, we're going to multiply what's been given. And Lord, I pray you multiply what's been given. God, you blessed us beyond measure. And God, I thank you for that. I realize that the Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of good above. So God, if we've been blessed, you blessed us. Lord, I realize as we leave this year and go to another year, there's not a person in here that knows what next year holds for them. But this one's behind us now. God, help us to be a greater blessing next year in a darker world than we've ever been. May we show Jesus everywhere we go. For it's in Christ's name that I do humbly pray. Amen. Amen. Mimi, me come. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Thank you, church. We're in God's house. May we be revived when we leave this place, when we came into this place. May it make a difference because we're here today. Wendy, you come and sing for us, please. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. 
I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus your name is power your name is healing your name is life break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire i just want to speak the name of jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression i speak jesus your name is power your name is healing your name is life yes it is break every stronghold and shine through the shadows burn like a fire your name is power and we declare it now your name is life break every stronghold and shine through the shadows burn like a fire shout jesus from the mountains jesus in the streets jesus in the darkness over every enemy and jesus for my family i speak the holy name Jesus, oh, shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Come, Holy Spirit. Your name. Your name is power. Your name. Break every stronghold and shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. shout jesus from the mountains jesus in the streets jesus in the darkness over every enemy 
and Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the street, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Wow. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, girl. Wow. That's true. As we go into this year, we ought to be shouting Jesus. We ought to be talking Jesus. We ought to be talking to Jesus. That's where our year ought to be because who only he knows how many more of those years that we have. All right. If you have your Bibles, we'll, of course, turn to Psalm 95. Psalm 95 represents something. Psalm 95 represents the fact for me that I've been here for 95 months, which is eight years today. We'll finish up today. We'll be finished our eighth year, and uh, next week we'll be starting our ninth year. And I just want to say thank you to this church for the way you pray, the way you love, and for letting me be here and never in a million years, 20 years ago, did I ever think that this would even be in my picture here. But God put you there for me at a time where I didn't know where I was going to do or what I was going to do. And uh, you showed up, and I thank you for that. All right. Have your Bibles. Let's turn to Psalm 96. And we want to talk about, and this is, it's amazing that this psalm occur, occurs at this time. Because this is a psalm about the future. This is a psalm about much, much windy sing, about joy, and about hope. And I can just tell you that in the world that we live in today, there hasn't been a lot of that. Because people under duress. And I'll tell you what this psalm tells us. Whether we want to see it or we understand it. We never understand it. But I'm here to tell you today that there's a sovereign God in heaven. And we may look at a world that's so crazy that we live in today, but I'm going to tell you something. There's a God that knows exactly what's going on. There's a God that knows where we're going. God rules this world. The scripture tells us, that God, the Lord, is the king of all nations. You mean Russia, preacher, China? Let me tell you something. Those folks wouldn't even exist if God didn't make them. God has got control of those folks. This thing is nothing. For you and I, it looks like the whole world's out of control. And that's the way cause we look at it. God says, eh, I got this. I knew this was coming. Matter of fact, this needed to come. And so, in this psalm, he gives a call out to make God the central focus of our living, of our worshiping in the days that we go ahead. This is a psalm that tells us that there is a time when all nations need to hear about God, where the word needs to be taken. Folks, that's where Lottie Moon comes in. We're going whatever y'all give, we already but we're gonna double that. So if it's five, six, seven, eight, whatever you give, church is done voted to double that. So we're gonna give so that people may hear about Jesus. Because that's what God would have the church to do. 
that we would take the Word of God to a world out there that doesn't know God, and that because of what you've given and other folks have given, that people might come to know Him. All peoples. So let's read this scripture together, and I'll try to break it down to you in three or four ways. The psalmist said, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. That's familiar. Because the Bible says that when we get into heaven, we'll have a new song, doesn't it? When you get into heaven, you won't be singing those songs. What's that song, an upside down world or whatever that is? We won't be singing that mess. We'll be singing, thank you, Jesus. Love you, Jesus. Praise. Hallelujah, God. That's what we'll be singing. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. And to sing unto the Lord all the earth. Now, what that literally means is what? The whole earth needs to hear the song of Jesus. The whole world needs to hear about Jesus. No matter where they're fighting at or what they're doing, there's not nobody ever breathed the breath of life in this world that don't want, shouldn't want to hear about Jesus now. And that's what he says. So he says, sing unto the Lord a new song. Then he says, sing unto the Lord and bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among who? The heathen. It don't matter what the world says. You declare Jesus. You stand for Jesus. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. All, all, all. For the Lord is great. He's greatly to be praised. And he is to be feared above all gods. So the psalmist knows that the world does not celebrate one God. He uses the term all gods. But he says there's only one God that you need to worry about. There's only one God that you need to fear. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord. See, that should be our theme for this coming year that I give God more than I did last year. More of me, more of my money, more of my praying time, more of my Bible study time, that this year I'm going to give him more. For most people in the world, you know what more would be? One verse of Scripture. Give him to the Lord the glory that is due unto him. Why does God deserve glory? Because he did for us what nobody else could do. Because he made us. You're here today because God created you. You're here today because God has sustained your life today. You're still living today because he didn't cut your breath off. And no wonder for some of you it's been a wonderful year, but next year may be the greatest year of your life. We don't know what a year holds. But, God does. God does. Glory due unto his name. He says, bring an offering and come in his courts. You know what that means? Come to worship. It's a known fact that for the most part, churches are dying today because we live in a world where they do not feel like going to church is necessary anymore. That studying and preaching and praying and singing is not something. We, we'll go to where we have a concert at. If they got a big band playing, we'll go. But if we got a preacher that's going to come and preach the word, they'll find something else to do. That's the world, folks, that you and I live in today. And it's all about Jesus Christ. It's what it's about. So give him the glory. That's do worship the Lord. If I could say a couple of things to you this year, this is one of them I'd say. And I, I'm telling you, I ain't got any of my message yet. But this is what I'd say. Make church a priority in your life this year. Wednesday nights, we'll preach around my kids in school. There ain't no better place you can have them in God's house. Sunday night, well, they need rest for school tomorrow. No, they need church. 
They need Jesus. They need to learn about him because of the world they're being sent out into today. Worship. Pray. Just make up in your mind that I'm going to give you a bare minimum here. That I'm going to pray at least one time a day. At bare minimum. But probably I'm going to try to pray three or four times a day. That's what I'm going to try to do. It says to come this year and to worship Him. Or worship Him and fear before Him all of the earth. Fear before Him all the earth. Who's all the earth? That's all the people that live on the earth he's talking about. I believe at some point in time, everybody fears God. There are those like God's people that live for Him and fear Him. That fear literally means respect. All. I do fear God today. Not because of what I'm afraid He's going to do to me, But I fear him because of what he can do for me. And he's blessed me. And I have faith in him. But the world fears him. Because of what the end is going to be. And what he may do to them. Oh yeah. He uses that term. May everybody that walks this earth have a fear of God. And say unto the heathen. Who are the heathen? <laughs> I grew up using that term. I know that in a uh, modern society that I live in today, that might not be a likable terminology. But I didn't say it. The Bible said it. He talked about a heathen world. That word heathen means what? Ungodly. Not walking with God. He says, woe to this heathen world that we live saying to the heathen tell them that Jesus reigned tell them that there is a God tell them that there was a Savior tell them that the end is coming tell them that Jesus is coming that is what we need to tell the world that we live in today say tell them that the Lord reigns the world shall be established and it shall not be moved understand something about God we don't understand a lot of stuff that goes on. I, I don't stand, understand most of why it goes on now today. That's, that's how far behind I am. But I can tell you this one thing. That verse of Scripture says that he shall judge the world righteously. Last year sometime, I'm sure Mimi will remember it. Some of you may remember it. I played a video one Sunday night. And it was a video and it was a song. And it talked about two men that were sitting in a restaurant having lunch together and talking. One man was trying to do what this verse of Scripture says. Tell him about a Savior. Tell him that there is hope ahead. But also tell him Everybody's got to talk to the Lord, as that verse of Scripture said. Everybody has to talk with Jesus. Remember that? So they get through with their dinner. They get in their cars, and they get ready to leave. This guy goes two blocks. Guy hits him head on and kills him. And in that song it says, then he had to go talk. With Jesus. That quick. He had to go. He says in this world that we live in today. That he will judge the people. By righteousness. Now we get this thing about judgment. A lot wrong. Sometimes we judge our relationship with God. By what we see other people. I know I must be a better Christian than them. I come to church more than they do. I know I must be a better 
Christian than them because I read my Bible all the time. I know I must be a better Christian than them because I see them out and around about town and I don't do the things that they do. But God is never going to judge me by what you did. He's never going to judge me about what my mom and daddy did. My sister. When I stand before God and talk to him, there's an old song, Brother Mark, that says, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Before I was ever born, Jesus was thinking about it. And so when I walk into that judgment room up there to talk with him, he ain't going to be worried about the churches I pastored. He ain't going to be worried about the people I knew. I'm going to be all that's on his mind right there. And everybody's got to walk in that room one day. I want to walk in there as a child of the king, a child of God. Verse 11 says, let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice. What's he talking about? He's talking about when he comes and he rules this world at the end of time. When Jesus comes back into Jerusalem and he sits down and he rules the world from there, understand something. It's going to be a different world than what we've got now. Matter of fact, the world we have now is nothing like the world we're going to have when Jesus comes back. It will be totally opposite from one another. People will not be shooting and killing and raping and busting the stores and killing brothers. All that's gone when he comes. What a day that's going to be. Last verse. Before the Lord, for he cometh. And when he comes, he comes to do what? Judge the earth. Second coming, totally different picture, totally different event. We just got through with his first coming last week with a manger and a crib. But he's coming back. And when he does, he's coming to judge the world now. He's going to come back as a judge. And that's when everybody's got to go see him. When he comes. And this is the word. And he will judge the world with righteousness. I fear for people. That think that living with a little bit of sin in their life is okay. I fear for people. That can take God or leave him. And still believe they're going to go to heaven. I fear folks like that. When we read this scripture, the Bible says there's one word, one thing, that Jesus will judge the world on. And it's not how many people I baptized. It's how many sermons I preached or how many songs you sang. It's going to be judged on one thing, and that's the righteousness of God. When he comes, what does that verse of Scripture say? That he will judge in what? Righteousness. What is righteous? Whatever God said. Whatever God said is righteous. And that's what he says that he will do. He will judge in righteousness, and the people, and I want you just to look at them last two words in that, in that thing. And the people with whose truth? His truth. Folks, there are a lot of false messages out there. From the churches, from friends, from sex. There are false messages everywhere. You get them on TV about every time you turn it on. A lot of false stuff out there. But it doesn't matter 
what Fox News says or what NBC News says, he ain't going to bring them up. He's going to bring me up. And he says, you will be drudged by what? My truth. By what I put in this book. That's what I will check off the boxes. Were you righteous? Did you love me? Did you, did, did you care for me? It's going to be my truth. Now, that's my introduction. Wow. I, and y'all think I'm lying, but I ain't lying. I got a five-point message here tonight. That's just it. I ain't got to the first. So y'all good? Okay. Let me just hit these very quickly. I'll tell you what they are pretty much to explain them a little bit. When you read this scripture, number one, you find the invitation to worship. Worship is important. I already told you that. Church needs to be a regular part of your life. Church needs to be a regular part of your children and your grandchildren. Life. Here, this scripture here is an invitation to worship and to worship a holy God and to praise Him. It's okay to say an amen. It's okay to give a shout. It's okay for a hallelujah. It's okay to raise your hand. It's okay to praise God. We all don't do it in the same way, but it's okay. When you get to heaven, that's what heaven's going to be like. That's what heaven's going to be like. And so he gives us here an invitation. He said to all people to come and worship. Why should we come and worship? Because I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm going to go to heaven one day, a shouting, as that song says. And it won't be anything I did, it'll be what he did. That cross opened the door. And I believe that with all of my heart. There's no other way to get there. You can't preach yourself there. You can't do nothing. A lot of preachers ain't going to go to heaven. I just hate to tell you that. It breaks my heart. So he gives us the invitation. Secondly, he gives us an inspiration to worship. In verses 4 through 6, he tells us that God is worthy of our worship. That God, I got a song that I've been listening to this week. Name that song. I brought that CD in here years ago. It's one of the first CDs I ever played. I didn't know what happened to that thing. And last Wednesday night, I was about there talking to Dwight, and I saw that CD laying up there. I hadn't seen that thing in years. I said, Dwight, what is that? He said, I don't know. It's been here for years. You want it? I said, yeah. And then I got to listening to it, and I thought, I brought that. And it talks in the first song on that CD. It says, the name of it is Please Close the Window. And it's talking about when Christ was about to die on the cross. And God says what? That he could not look on the death of his son for my sin and yours. And so in heaven, God sends out the word. Please close the windows. I don't want to see it anymore. Worthy of worship because of that cross right there. Worthy of worship. That should be my inspiration. It is an invitation to worship. In 1 through 3, it is an inspiration for worship. I want you to, at the end of last month, I preached to you the 95th Psalm, right? Because I preached 96 this morning. So at the end of November, I preached the 95th Psalm. Very similar. Verse 3 of the 95th Psalm says this. For the Lord is a great God and great King above all gods. My inspiration for worshiping God is realizing that I'm going to heaven because of Him, not because of me. My inspiration is God that he is to be feared above all gods on this earth. So he is the invitation to worship. He is a, 
inspiration from our worship. Verses 7 through 9 kind of tells us how we're to worship. It's our instruction for worship. Verses 7 through 9. God is a holy God. For most of the biggest part of the Bible, most of the people in the Bible, including the own people of God, worshiped false idols. The thing that got the children of Israel killed, wiped out, their nations taken away from them, if you've been on Wednesday night, is that God, they could not get past the first commandment, which said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And they paid a price for that. The world is full of gods now, just like it is then. You see, I've heard preachers say this all my life. What is a, what is a God? A God, or the God, is the thing that is most important to you in your life. That's your God. Now, if it's the holy God that you're going to serve him worship, that's your God. But if it's your job, your bank account, your car, or what you got in stocks and bonds, if that's what you, only thing you're trying to go through the world and have that and you leave God out, God help you. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So he tells me that in this Scripture, that it's God alone that needs to be worshipped. And this is what I think as a preacher. And as I, you know, I don't have, uh, I realize I don't have that much longer to preach. But this is something that, as I was studying this, that kind of connected with me a little bit about worship. Worship should never be a casual experience. If it's just a check off a box type thing, and you're here for the wrong reason. If your mama can call you and say, yeah, well, I went to church this morning. That ain't the right reason to come to church. Church and worship should be a, not a casual, but it should be a soul moving thing, a soul stirring thing when we come into the house of God. For some, like the night I got saved, it can be a traumatic thing. That's what it was for me. And the last thing was this. The impact of worship. Verses 10 through 13. The psalmist makes this announcement. God rules the world. As children, we were growing up and we were raised up singing this song. He's got the whole world in his hands. That's what that psalmist that wrote that psalm says, that he is Lord over all. I am a firm believer. Now, I get kicked back on this, but that's okay. I believe that the Lord God is over all the affairs of mankind. I believe he's over it all. Well, if he's over it all, why is he letting stupid and crazy and awful things happen in the world, preacher, if he's over it all? Hey, he told you it was coming, didn't he? Read your Bible. Read the 24th chapter of Matthew. Ain't nothing happened that he didn't warn us was going to happen yet. Be here tonight. I'll show you something. Ain't nothing happening that he didn't say was going to happen. So he does, I believe, rule in the heart in all the affairs of man. He uses the term in there where he says the world is firmly established. This is my father's world. He made it from nothing. He made every star, the moon, the sun, the earth, and all them, whatever they say is in outer space, he made them all. I don't know what all that stuff is, but I want to tell you my God controls it all. He talks about all creation. 
worshiping God. My wife, I'm glad she left. About what I'm going to say here. We were somewhere yesterday, or, or Friday, and uh, there was this little girl that, uh, you know, we saw something on TV where this little, little puppy saved this little girl's life. And my wife said, I told you there going to be dogs in heaven. I said, really? She said, I promise you. And then I played a song, a CD on a song, where it talked about the lion laying down with the lamb. She said, if a lion's got to be there and a lamb's got to be there, why come a dog can't be there? She's always, every time she'll hit me with that. And then the other folks that hit me say, well, we know there are going to be horses because when Jesus comes back, he's going to be riding what? A white horse. So excuse me. Whatever. I'll let God. He made heaven. He made earth. He can take care of it. He don't need my help. The final verse. He talks about the final day. And understand this. There will be a final day for you and for me. We don't like to think about it. But it's coming. And not only that, there will be a final day for this world that you and I live in today. See, mankind has gotten smart and think they're so smart. They got, they got everything figured out how this world's going to be in the next 50 years. And God sits back and laughs at these jokers. Because he says one day will be the last day. That this world stands. So what happens on that final day? He says, I will judge the world in perfect righteousness. That's what judgment's going to be at. The wicked that never trusted Jesus. What will happen to them? They will be cast out. They will be cast out. They'll be punished. The righteous will be rewarded. So I hope as we close out this year, that we'll listen to what this psalm is saying. Let me give you this one thought that comes out of that. That scripture tells us that as believers and as Christians, we ought to be involved in global missions. That we ought to be involved in seeing that everybody can hear the word, hears the word. Let me, folks, y'all do a great job of that. Y'all are amazing. But that's the job of the church in the last days is if we aren't caring about reaching out and going out and doing stuff, we can never be faithful to what God wants us to do. But most times we're worried about what goes on inside these four walls here. So we need to support. And what is the message? He says it in this scripture. God says, I got a message for you. I got a theme for you. If you want to put a theme on a banister for next year or, or put it up there when everybody can see it, he says, I got one for you. The Lord is righteous. His word is true. That's what the message needs to be. If you stand on that, and I told you this a couple of weeks ago, this has kind of been, for a, a little while now, the, the kind of turning point where I kind of look at how I live my life day to day and the things that I do to day to day. And you got a very imperfect preacher. I'm going to tell you that right now. Makes a lot of mistakes. But we're seeing it abound. Grace did much more abound. That's why I can stand up here and talk like this. 
The last night I asked him to forgive me of my sins. I could tell you something that would change your whole life in three words. When you wake up tomorrow, you'll be in a new year. Might be your last year. You don't know. Might be the worst year of your life. You don't know. Could be the greatest year of your life. But I can tell you one thing that will help you get through it better. It just come to me about three or four months ago, and I, I, I think about this every day. I'm thinking about putting this up on my car window. Is it biblical? Is where I'm about to go biblical? Is what I'm about to say biblical? Is what I'm about to think biblical? If I proceed in that and keep that thing on my mind about my daily life and where I live, is it biblical? Then when I meet the Lord, oh, I'll have plenty to account for. But I'm hoping he'll say one day, Jimmy, I watched you when you stood there at Southside and you preached. And I heard you tell them people to examine their lives, where they're doing, what they're going, where they're headed, and ask this simple question. Is it biblical? Because folks, we ain't going to be judged by what Republicans say, what Democrats say, what nobody says. And when you go into the Lord and meet Him that day, He ain't going to open the Constitution. He's going to open this book right here. Is it biblical? That'd be the best thing that I know that I could tell you. Well, give me some hint about a New Year's resolution, preacher. Is it biblical? Is my staying home tonight biblical? Or is Sunday the Lord's day? All day. Is it biblical? And not biblical because of something I told you. But something that book said right there. Because you don't have to account for me. But you do have to account for that. So in this coming year, I didn't get my message done, but I'm through. I think we, we understand that none of us knows. Matter of fact, we, there'll be a lot of people who ain't even going to make it till next year. Well, you say, preacher, it's 20 minutes to 12. What do you mean? They ain't gonna, oh, no, there are a lot of people that's living right now ain't going to make it to midnight tonight. They could be out in eternity somewhere. Probably by the tens of thousands, more than that probably. Ain't going to make it to midnight. Where'd he go be? They'll be where they chose to be. I'll close this. My Sunday school lesson this morning. By the way, let me give you another good clue to help make your life better. Come to Sunday school next year. Make Sunday school a part of your worship. We got a class for everybody. I told my Sunday school classes. We were talking about Adam and Eve, and we were talking about their sons, Cain and Abel. And you know the story of how Cain killed his brother. God asked him why. He said, am I my brother's keeper? God said, I'll tell you what. You're angry and you're mad. But I'm going to give you another chance to get forgiveness of this. And he did like many people. He refused and said, that's okay. And that's when God put the curse on him. How many times have I had to, had to go to God and say, God, forgive me? Not many days in my life go by I don't have to say something like that. Having to deal with the crazy people in this world, they make you like that. Make you have bad thoughts, won't wreck you sometimes. Well, you say it or not. Kind of like the old preacher said, they said, do you cuss? And, I, and he said, no, but I write it down on a piece of paper and think about it. So 
That's, that's kind of me. I don't cuss. And I literally don't write it down. But some, hey, Do I want to sometimes? You better bet your boots I want to sometimes. But I don't. I promise you that. God, this is what the invitation is about. Number one, if you're not sure about heaven, or sure you're going there, God says, come here. I'll take you there, and I'll write your name in glory. But you must come to him. He gave Abel a second chance. I mean, Cain, he said he didn't want it. So I'm going to tell you today, God loves you. There's nothing better will happen on the new year than to walk into that new year as a child of God. I'm going to tell you that right now. And it's a simple method. You ask God to forgive you, he will. If you believe he died for you on that cross, you believe it in your heart, you can walk into this year, as I use that term quite a bit today, with no fear about tomorrow. Like that old gospel song says, many things about tomorrow I don't understand. Many things about tomorrow I don't understand. But this is what I do understand. God holds my hand. So no matter what I face next year, no matter what you face, you cling to that hand that loves you. You hold on to that hand. I hope it's the best year of your life, but if it ain't, you hold on to that hand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of worship, for the privilege of coming into your house, for the privilege of preaching and fellowshipping God with your people. Now, as we get ready to go home today, get ready to prepare tonight, and get ready to go into a new year at midnight tonight. God, May we start focusing more on you and less of on me and less of this world. God, there may be one here today that Lord may be saying, I'm not sure, preacher, but I do know that I don't like what I'm seeing in the world and I'd like to leave here knowing that it's okay that you say me. For that one here that may be going into this world this new year with fear in their life, you said that if we fear you, we need not fear anything else. God, may our faith grow stronger. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got us in his hands. Lord, as we sing this song, if there's somebody that needs encouraging, may they pray. If there's somebody that's not sure about their relationship, whether they go, go to heaven or not, Lord, don't let them stay any longer. You just let them come down and let's get this right. Lord, bless now. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 307, hymn number 307. Would you stand with us, please, as we sing? Lord, this year, help me put you first. What a commitment. What a change in life that would be. It's like I am, Lord. I, I come to you and say, next year, use me, God. Oh, Lamb of God. What's going on, my baby?
Bless you. This is a good, good Sunday morning. I appreciate you coming today and worshiping the Lord. I, I gotta say, uh, we'll be here tonight. Working, we're gonna be bringing in the New Year in church tonight. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, the four horsemen of the end times, and we will go over every one of those. And they will give a picture of what's heading this way. So you come back and be with us tonight as we begin to, to share that message with you. Mr. Richard, would you just miss us with prayer?